Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Behavioral Science Statistics, and in it, we're looking at the uh, questions and answers to the third online quiz for Chapter 10, which is on the analysis of variance. The first chapter in this, uh, excuse me, the first question in this quiz is, which of the following numbers is a possible value for eta squared? And it's minus 0.39, 1.96, minus 3.30, or 0.16. Well, the answer is 0.16, and the reason for that is eta squared can only be positive, and it goes from 0 to 1. So the two negative numbers, a and c, are just out, and the 1.96 is greater than 1. Now, I threw that in there because that's a common critical value for a z-test, and people tend to jump at that one. But of these, the only one that's positive between 0 and 1 is 0.16. And the reason it's between 0 and 1 is because eta squared is a ratio, and it says what percentage of the variance is due to the effect. So that's the effect of the difference between the group means, and that's what's on the top. SS is just a step in the way to the variance, and you can use it as a substitute for variation. And you see we have the SS on the top, and then we have the for the, the effect of the difference between the groups on the top, and then we also have on the bottom plus the error, which is everything else. So it's a ratio uh, or percentage, and so it, it can't be negative. It has to be between 0 and 1. So out of the Possible values for eta squared, 0.16 is our only choice from the uh, question. Number two, why is it better to use a one-way analysis of variance, or ANOVA, than multiple t-tests to compare the means of several groups? The choices are ANOVA handles large sample sizes better, or B, ANOVA handles missing data better, or C, multiple t-tests inflate the type 1 error rate, or D, multiple t-tests inflate the type 2 error rate. Well, the answer is C. Multiple t-tests inflate the type 1 or false positive error rate. Uh, D is about the type 2. That's the false negative error rate, and that, that's just a whole other situation. Now, these other two about whether it handles large sample sizes better, no, it doesn't have them any better than t-tests, and I'm not aware that it handles missing data any better. Um, but let's take a look at C here. Now, here's a chart that I added a little late to the, uh, the chapter, and it shows you what what's called the family-wise error rate, and that is if you have several groups and you do t-tests to compare every possible group with each other, um, the the alpha rate or the type one error rate or false positive error rate it accumulates, it goes up. Now it doesn't just add because it's a maximum of one, and and it's this it tapers off. But you can see here that um, you know by the time you get to 15 groups, you're you're basically guaranteed to have at least one false positive in there. Um, in fact, you only need six groups to have over a 50% chance of a false positive. And so that's why doing multiple t-tests uh, with just the straight um, alpha of 05 for each test is a problem. And the analysis of variance works better because it does a single test to determine whether there's a difference in the means anywhere in the groups that you have. All right, if an analysis, if an analysis of variance is conducted and eta squared is 0.10, then uh, A, 10% of the scores on the DV can be predicted correctly or correctly predicted, or B, 10% of the variance in the DV can be predicted by the IVs, or 10% of the scores have missing values, or D, the null hypothesis should be retained. The answer is B, 10% of the variance in the DV can be predicted by the IVs. Now, the, the top one, A, 10% of the scores on the DV can be correctly predicted, that's a nice idea here, but... Or dealing with a quantitative variable where things are measured usually imprecisely anyhow. This is not a classification question. It's we're predicting variance, and so uh, predicting 10% is not the right question. Also, 10% of the scores have missing values. Now, that's just that's just a whole other thing. And the null hypothesis should be retained. Now, eta squared is an effect size. It's not the same thing as the inferential test. And it's the inferential test, in this case the F uh, test, the F value, that determines whether you should or should not uh, retain or reject the null hypothesis. A squared simply says how big the effect size is, and it's the F test that says whether that's likely to have arisen by chance. Anyhow, let's take a quick look then at the formula for the effect size. Remember, it's a ratio, and it says what percentage of the total variance, which is can be seen as the sum of squares for the effect or there's between the groups, uh, plus all the uh, variance within, what percentage of that is due to the difference between the groups? And this one says, so 10% or an eta squared of 0.10 means that if you know the group means, then you can accurately predict 
10% of the variance between uh, the scores. 10% um, is not a lot, but sometimes it's easy to get to, and uh, it can be helpful. Okay, number four, with small type. Imagine a study that compared men and women, that's the gender factor, who were socially liberal or conservative, the social attitudes factor, on levels of empathy. If there were significant differences between people with liberal and conservative social attitudes, regardless of gender, then the attitude factor would be called A, a spurious effect, B, a significant interaction effect, C, a significant manipulation effect, or D, a significant main effect. Now, you've seen this question before, except it was gender that was significant last time, and here it's uh, social attitudes. But the answer is still a significant main effect. A spurious effect means one that's accidental shouldn't be there. That would be a type 1 error, and you, you really have no way of knowing that just by the, the results of your one analysis. An interaction effect would say that, for instance, that empathy varied as a joint function of gender and social attitudes, and that's not what we have here. Significant manipulation effect, I just made that term up. Um, anyhow, here's uh, what it would look like. Now, previously we had it that the two bars on the left were higher than the two bars on the right. That was a significant effect for factor B. This is a significant main effect for factor A. And so the first level or category in A is the blue bars. And you see that the blue bars to get are both at 8, so they have an average of 8, and that the red bars, are, which are the second category or level of factor uh, A, both have 4. So the blue bars together are higher than the red bars together, and so that's a significant main effect for factor A. And number five, what is the purpose of a post hoc test? The choices are A, to calculate the effect size A to squared, B, to determine whether the sample size was sufficient, C, to find out which groups or combination of groups are different from each other, and D, to determine whether there are any interaction effects. The answer here is C, to find out which groups or combinations of groups are different from each other. Now, to calculate the effect size eta squared, that's just a different calculation. Post hoc tests, which means after the fact, uh, which are usually a series of t-tests with adjusted alphas to keep the family-wise error rate consistent, that's an inferential test. So post hoc tests are inferential tests. The effect size eta squared is a different thing. Um, to determine whether the sample size was sufficient, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a power calculation, it's called, and that's based on effect size, and that's a different issue. Determine whether there are any interaction effects. No, that's what you get by examining for interaction effects in a two-way or higher analysis of variance. But let's take a quick look. Again, we've seen this chart before. It shows four different groups, and these are the population distributions for each group, north, south, east, and west. You see, for instance, that north is way down low compared to the others, uh, that's the blue one, and that the south and west are identical. They got exactly the same mean, and the east is slightly higher. And so you would use the post hoc test to determine that, yes, north is different from everybody else, um, south and west are not different from each other, and east is higher than all of them. Anyhow, that's the purpose of a post hoc test. Anyhow, and that's it for the third quiz in Chapter 10.